So with longleaf pine, um, we've already gone over a, a little bit of this throughout the course, so some of it will be review, um, but I just kind of wanted to go ahead and tie it all together for you. So for context, longleaf pine used to span about 90 million acres, and so you can see it really would have been the dominant forest cover type across much of the southern coastal plain. Um, had kind of a minimal presence in the West Gulf. You can see uh, two or three disjunct little patches of the range uh, here. And if you actually look at the range map, uh, it only would have just touched in barely into southeastern Nacogdoches County. Um, so right here, we're pretty much, you know, if you go a little east of us, we're pretty much at the northern extent of longleaf pine here in the western Gulf region. Um, and so during a normal field station, uh, we'll go out with Campbell Global and uh, look at some sites uh, down near Dam B, uh, south of Sam Rayburn Reservoir. And that's right in the heart of Longleaf Ridge country, uh, where you have <clears throat> some relatively steep topography there uh, with sandy ridge tops. And so that's the sort of areas you would often find Longleaf on here in East Texas. But you can see it would cover a, a diverse array of soils and topography further east. Um, if you look up here in Alabama and even Georgia, Longleaf actually makes it pretty far north. And so this population over here in Alabama, uh, they consider kind of like the mountain Longleaf. Uh, when we say mountain, the Southern Appalachians do extend down through Georgia and here into Alabama, but by the time they get to this point, you're looking at areas that are 1,000, 2,000 feet in elevation. So they're not really substantial mountains at that point. but certainly higher than the coastal plain, a few hundred feet above sea level. So we had uh, 90 million acres, about two thirds of that was ecosystems where longleaf was dominant, one third or so uh, would be longleaf mixed with other species. Um, and really our other pines were confined to different areas. Um, I was just out at a site last Friday filming uh, for field station for this summer. And it was a 95 year old longleaf stand. Many of you were out on it, the Sandy Creek stand where you did the fuel loading exercise. Um, and if you remember, we walked down that slough um, and we saw the poison sumac uh, down in the little seep at the bottom of the hill um, where Madeline ate the poison sumac. Um, but right down there, all of a sudden, once you get in that little wet spot with Sweet Bay, Red Bay, poison sumac, you started picking up loblolly. So that's where the loblolly would have been. Loblolly would have been confined more to the wet sites, and it would have been confined there because they wouldn't have burned as regularly. And so, you know, Loblolly is the least fire adapted of the southern yellow pines uh, compared to shortleaf and longleaf or other two natives out here in the West Gulf. And so that, that's, it would have been confined to wetter areas almost exclusively. Of course, they logged all this out. We'll go over that in a moment. And uh, this 2.5 million acres, we, we've been replanting a lot of it. We may be up to three, three and a half million now. Um, a, a lot of agencies have goals of getting us up to 8 million, but you can see even if we get up to 8 million, that's less than 10% of the original range. Here's a photo you may have seen in other classes of a quote unquote virgin longleaf stand. Um, for some reason, uh, they, they, somebody decided to colorize this one. I found this one on the internet. And I don't think, I don't know what they think was going on the ground there. I guess they thought pine straw was sort of a sea foam green, um, but made some interesting artistic choices there. And so uh, when you think about it, low historically, we would have had some longleaf stands like this, certainly. Um, but, you know, photography was pretty uncommon uh, back in the 1800s. They really only would have taken pictures of pretty exceptional stands. Um, Here's some data on um, a virgin longleaf pine stand uh, in Baldwin County, Alabama. And again, the, the term virgin, that's more just a anthropogenic concept. That's just people claiming a forest has never been impacted, ideally never logged. It's not really a silvicultural term. It's not really an ecological term. Um, it's just a warm, fuzzy term. Um, but if you look at this data right here, this is from a 1907 publication. And so this is a uh, turn of the last century. And uh, they found this stand, got some basic biometric data for you. Um, but this stand, it was pretty low in terms of stocking. It only had 53 trees an acre. 
only had 106.5 square feet per acre of basal area. But if you look at the diameter distribution, it did have a lot of relatively large trees. Um, so some of them were in excess of two feet in diameter, uh, but the average, the tree of average diameter from a basal area standpoint, the QMD was 19.2 inches. Um, site index 50 years on this site would have been 105 feet. This stand was in excess of uh, 50 years. So you're probably looking at uh, average canopy height of about 120 uh, feet on this stand. So you can see it's a pretty low stocking stand with large trees. But when you look at this photo here, you know, those trees are much larger than 19 inches QMD. Um, the average diameter out in this stand is, you know, probably two feet plus. And so, you know, th this might reflect a more typical condition where stocking was a little lower. Um, you had big trees, but they weren't just, you know, enormous. Um, so two things happened really uh, to get rid of longleaf pine in the south. Um, a wave of turpentiners actually moved through. And so they would go and they would cut these herringbone patterns into the trees um, and then put different little uh, gutters down at the bottom, uh, get this uh, resin that came out of the tree into a bucket. And then they would take all the buckets and keep in mind, this is about the time um, that uh, oil was first being discovered in Louisiana and Texas. Um, so we, we really didn't have any oil yet, any petroleum. So they were using uh, different products from our southern pines and other trees uh, for a lot of those similar purposes. And so they collected the resins, they would put it in a, a still, distill it and make turpentine and other industrial chemicals. And so with, with this turpentining, they would go through, they would turpentine all the trees in the stand, and it was the idea where you just keep moving west. It's this inexhaustible resource, there's always more trees. Um, you can see as they've done it on this tree here, you're pretty much gonna kill the tree. Uh, so they were pretty aggressive in their turpentining. They killed a lot of the trees. Uh, they would then clear the stand after it had been turpentined out um, and convert it to agriculture often. Um, in some cases, uh, they came up with the theory uh, that this turpentining, you know, took the essence out of the tree and it weakened it was the theory. And so sometimes they would just, you know, fell these, pile them and burn them. And so they wouldn't even use the timber out of these. And again, uh, you know, th these are slow grown longleaf pines for the most part. Um, if you go and you find some of these old pine boards nowadays, we're so used to getting two by fours and other timber from Lowe's, Home Depot. And if you're building something with those two by fours, you're framing something out, you can bang a nail into those no problem. Um, but if you take a modern nail and you try and bang it into a board that's sawn from some of these slow grown uh, older pines, they're incredibly hard. It's like working with oak or something like that. You'll bend nails um, and you'll have a lot of trouble driving them. So here's some more examples of the turpentining operation where they would use uh, different livestock to pull them on the carts. And you can see uh, these trees are done for. They are not gonna survive. Um, these stills were localized. They were pretty small. Uh, you, you didn't have OSHA or much in the way of safety regulations. So they tended to explode at a relatively high frequency. Um, so it was pretty dangerous work as well. And so they, they did a lot of turpentining. They didn't turpentine every stand, but th there was a fair bit of turpentining. Um, before they even got to logging low, there were other things they would do with longleaf pine. And so if you look at the University of North Carolina and the state of North Carolina, their mascot is the Tar Heels. It's the Tar Heel State. And so what they would do is they would pull old stumps, heartwood of longleaf out after they'd logged it. They would put them in a big pile and they would set them on fire and then they would throw dirt on top. So it would gradually smolder and they would dig uh, trenches around the outsides of it. And that would uh, exude the tar out of the wood is what they called it. It was kind of burnt resin. And so that would accumulate in the trenches they dug, they could collect it there but they would have people that would run across the tops of this dirt mound with the smoldering fire on the inside of it, and they would tend it, poke it with a stick, whatever. And so they would get some of this tar on their feet, and that's why North Carolina is the, the Tar Heel state to this day. It was a product they made out of longleaf pine primarily. Um, but they used um, a, a lot of that resin, that quote unquote tar, 
uh, they used the wood to build ships, wooden ships. They used the, the tar uh, to waterproof those ships. And so at one point, the U.S. South was the naval stores capital of the world. Um, we were producing the raw materials that were building whole navies out of wooden ships um, uh, that, you know, really changed the course of world history. And so that came out of this longleaf pine forest. Um, as, as they started getting more commercial with the logging, they did a lot of it with rail lines. Uh, so think back to Dendro, we went out on the tram road lab um, where, you know, that road was really long, really straight. And then we got to the end of it where we did uh, Black Willow and you could see those old piers. So that would have been a rail line. So they had a lot of rail lines like that. Um, they actually, you know, uh, had uh, equipment that would go on some of these rail cars. It was basically just a big winch. And so they would use that kind of like a skitter um, to winch logs uh, back. And these rail lines, a lot of them were temporary. They would put them in, they would harvest all the timber. Um, and then on their way out, they would pull the rail lines uh, so that they could reuse um, the, the iron and everything uh, in a subsequent logging job. So again, th this wasn't sustainable. They were just going in and timbering, uh, cutting all these trees down, no thought to regeneration. Much of the land was converted to agriculture after this, but the idea was you can keep moving west. Uh, so this would have started in the 1700s in the Carolinas, uh, Georgia, on the Atlantic coast, and then they worked their way west and it really hit Texas in the late 1800s and even into the early 1900s. Here you can see uh, where they've put a lot of the timber uh, in uh, a river, and so you could raft them down to a mill that way. Um, this used to be done all over the country. The Northeast was logged this way. That's, they logged a lot of spruce and fir, and they would actually build huge dams in the Northeast um, and then wait for snow melt in the spring. These ponds would fill up they'd blow the dam and that's how they would get the timber uh, down some relatively small creeks into larger rivers and eventually to the mill. Um, this, this of course is now completely illegal under the Clean Water Act. Uh, so uh, the last log float in the US I think was in the late 1970s up in Maine. Um, but uh, this is where we get the Sylvan's event burling from. People used to have to run around out on these log rafts and they weren't tied together or anything like that because they would jam. So they'd have to run around on these logs, not fall in and get killed. Um, and use some long sticks basically to try and clear uh, jams as they snagged on different things in the, in the rivers. So. And if you look at the mill infrastructure, uh, again, so some years when you all go to field station, do the mill tour, you see the basket factory. Um, and, you know, we always get good uh, reactions from the students to the basket factory and their particular perspective on safety. Uh, back in the day, that probably would have been a really safe mill. Um, so if you look at, it was a bunch of just tiny mom and pop mills for the most part. So let's look at just our little uh, area here. So if you add Nagadoches County, Sabine County, uh, San Augustine County, and Angelina County together. So this little four county area here right around us, um, you're looking at what, like six, 700 mills. Uh, so it was just an enormous number of these really small mills. Uh, they would burn down at a really high frequency and just, you know, either be rebuilt or abandoned. But they basically popped up these little mills near areas where logging was pretty intensive. And then they didn't last too long. Uh, they ended up going out of business uh, as soon as the timber was logged out of that area. <clears throat> and so here you can see some uh, a picture of the mill on the upper left. And when you look at the sawmills they had here, um, some of them had band saws, but many of them had the, the round rotary blade, kind of like a huge circular saw. <coughs> Excuse me. And th they would be open. They really wouldn't have much in the way of safety guards. Um, so remember our forestry program at SFA started here in 1946. Uh, so at field station back even in, uh, into, I believe like the late 60s, they, they did a sawmill exercise uh, where you were literally just like pushing a log at an open, unguarded circular saw blade uh, <laughs> with the professor basically telling you, you know, you got to saw this to get your grade, don't fall in. Uh, so uh, probably not something we would get away with today. I can't imagine what would happen if Culhavy was there, uh, given his focus on safety during field station. But uh, look at all the rail lines too, lots of different rail lines. Um, they would have varied in gauge, it wasn't standardized. Um, and so some of these, you know, wouldn't even, you wouldn't even be able to get a train off of one of them and onto a different one. 
Um, so just lots of scattershot operations throughout our entire region. So that's a little bit about the history. And of course, we know Longleaf has a grass stage. So once they logged it out, it had this grass stage, which put it at a competitive disadvantage. Um, the other thing that put it at a real competitive disadvantage is you're looking at irregular seed crop production, only three years, five years, seven years, somewhere in there uh, between good seed years. So most of the time when they were cutting out these longleaf stands, again, it wasn't silviculture. They weren't thinking about regeneration. They weren't doing cone counts. They weren't timing this right. They had no infrastructure to plant trees, no nurseries, anything like that. And so they were cutting these out and most of the time it was not a good seed year and they just flat out didn't regenerate. But when you look at longleaf, you've got a grass stage, then it goes to a small seedling, and that'll break out into this candelabra stage. Um, when they're in this grass stage, uh, or a little bit beyond it, like you see here, uh, they'll get a brown spot needle blight. That's a common native pathogen uh, that occurs. And the best treatment for that is in any sort of pesticide, it's just fire. And so the fire will burn off the affected needles and usually clear it up, so. Uh, so fire is not just a tool with longleaf to break it out of the grass stage and control competition. It also helps control some disease issues. Um, they'll eventually get a little bit larger. Here you see one with, you know, multiple arms, as it were, the branches uh, in this candelabra stage here. Um, but you've all seen longleaf pine buds. Uh, they're huge compared to the other southern pines. Uh, they're silver. They're fuzzy. These buds are designed to get rid of heat. And so it's a light color, so it reflects any uh, radiative heat. Um, but then they can gradually burn through all this material while it protects the apical meristem in the inside. The steam as they burn will also help release heat and keep that apical meristem alive. So this bud is really designed with fire in mind. Um, that being said, you can see this thing just actively flushed before it set this rusting bud. So when you look at them and you see this white flush when they're actively growing in height, so kind of this one's about to start, that is not a time when you want to put a fire through a longleaf stand. So if you went out to a young longleaf stand right now, given our weather this uh, spring, um, they're probably actively flushing right now and you're getting that you know six inch to foot long white fuzzy leader on there that hasn't reset a new resting bud that's not a time when you want to burn longleaf. You'll get a lot more mortality because on this little seedling right here, if you kill this terminal bud, it is dead. Longleaf is not a species that re-sprouts. And so what you're really focused on doing when managing fire with a young longleaf stand, keep your buds alive and the trees stay alive. So it's really about the condition of that bud. If it has a firm set resting bud, you can probably put a fire through at any time of year. But when the buds are not resting or dormant when they're actively flushing, that's not the time to burn longleaf. <clears throat> so here's what this looks like. Um, so this is the idea of putting a ground fire through a longleaf stand. And the general rule of thumb for longleaf with fire, uh, longleaf is variable. You, ha you have to think about that. We're used to pine, lava -like pine plantations where you plant seedlings that are all about the same size. They all grow in height at about the same rate. Uh, they all <clears throat> excuse me, they all grow in diameter at about the same rate. And so when you look at that longleaf pine plantation, it's very uniform. Even if you plant a longleaf stand, so even if you plant seedlings that are all about the same size, it's going to be a variable stand because they grow in diameter at different rates. And that diameter growth rate is really what dictates when they break out of the grass stage. So when you get the root collar diameter, that's RCD on this graph, root collar diameter of about three quarters of an inch, that's when they'll break out of the grass stage and start initiating height growth. Um, they have a nice tap root at that point and they can grow rapidly in height. So here's what happens. When you have the grass stage with a small root collar diameter, fire can easily kill that seedling. With that small root collar diameter, they don't have as many needles there to protect that bud from getting damaged. You kill the bud, you kill the seedling. Then when they have that root collar diameter larger than half an inch, so that's larger than half an inch up to you know three quarters of an inch or so when they're gonna break out of the grass stage, those little uh, grass stage seedlings are extremely resistant to fire. Um, so you can put a fire through at that point. And what's gonna happen here, you're gonna have some of these seedlings out there. These are your seedlings that haven't grown as well. That ground fire may kill them, 
these are much more resistant, it will be unlikely to kill them. And so again, that rule of thumb, you're almost always going to kill some seedlings, you're almost never going to kill all of them. And so that may help you with brown spot needle blight. Well, then you break out into height growth, and we've seen that actively growing small longleaf seedling. Well, at first, it only has that one bud. You kill the bud, you kill the seedling again. And so again, you're going to be susceptible to a fire at that point. As they get taller, the bark gets thicker, makes them more resistant to fire. They also gain more buds. So even if you kill some of those lateral buds, as long as the terminal bud or one bud near the top of the tree is alive, that tree can do okay. And as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, they become more and more and more resistant to fire. And so it is one of our most uh, fire resistant trees in the Southern US. Keep in mind, it's not perfectly fire adapted. Um, it does not resprout, short leaf will resprout. That's its adaptation to fire. Um, and it doesn't have strotinous cones. So long leaf does not have strotinous cones. That's something that gets forgotten a lot um, just because everybody thinks long leaf fire, long leaf fire, long leaf fire but that doesn't mean it has a serotonous cone. Okay, so when you look at the sites that uh, you find longleaf on, we know here in East Texas, commonly they would often be on sandy soils. Um, and so that's true in many places in the US South, but it's a common misconception that longleaf only grows on deep sandy xeric soils. So when we talk about longleaf, let's think about that history. Uh, so they cut a lot of it out, much of it didn't regenerate. Then think about what they did with the land. The best land that they cut longleaf off of went into agriculture and remained in agriculture. Uh, so that land was lost for longleaf production. Many of the sites that weren't the best but weren't the worst, the marginal sites, they cut them out. They, got, they may have used it for agriculture for a time, didn't work out, it was abandoned. And many of those sites were revegetated into forest, either naturally or by seeding or by planting. Uh, and those are now forested areas, uh, mixed pine hardwood, natural stands, um, or even pine plantations nowadays. And so uh, that's what we have there now. So if you want to look at the stands that would have remained, <coughs> excuse me, the stands that would have remained um, in longleaf pine, it's the sites where we didn't want to use them for agriculture and we didn't want to use them to manage other forests. And so those are deep sandy soils we just couldn't do anything else with. On those deep sandy sites, what you'll find if you plant longleaf and you plant loblolly, longleaf will outcompete loblolly. On just about any other site, loblolly will outcompete longleaf because it doesn't have to go through the protracted uh, grass stage. So that's where we find longleaf today and that's why we find longleaf on deep sandy sites today. But prior to us cutting it all out, Remember, Pinus palustris, palustris means swampy land. And so you would have found wet savannas even with longleaf in them here at the bottom, um, with pitcher plants and all sorts of diverse species. Um, it would have grown on uplands of all sorts of different soil textures, clay, silt, sand. So it wasn't just deep sandy soils. Um, it would have grown uh, mixed in with other species like post oak, blackjack oak, southern red oak, black hickory, blue jack oak, and then we're not getting runner oak uh, this, this semester, or in dendro uh, here, but that's kind of like a smaller version of post oak if you want to think about it that way. So it really would have grown with a bunch of other different species of trees, not just as a monoculture, and so that's what we think of with longleaf. We think of it as just dry sandy sites. It's not true. Um, that's where we've left it. Um, but it used to be over a much greater range of sites. Let's think about how we can grow longleaf pine. Uh, so this is some data from the Silvics of North America. Um, and here's mean annual increment in tons per acre per year. Um, so you can see all the numbers on here are pretty low, right? Um, we were getting higher numbers than this. If you think all the way back to our P Tata lab, we were getting higher mean annual increments in any of our scenarios. So that pine stand we visited um, had a higher MAI than this. So these are relatively low mean annual increments, but if you look at the x-axis, there's a reason for that. These are not plantations where they're trying to ramp through growth as quickly as possible. These are older stands. And they're also, if you look at the title of the graph, they're natural stands. These are not plantations, okay? Um, so if you do have a natural stand, Loblolly will beat out 
long leaf when it's young. It'll have a higher mean annual increment when it's young. But if you look at long leaf, its mean annual increment is going to culminate later in the rotation. So if you do want to go on a longer rotation, that a rotation this long is never going to maximize financial gain. It's too long for that. But if you want to go on a longer rotation and manage for, you know, high quality, large timber, utility poles, um, if you want to manage your forest for cash flow rather than just maximizing financial gain, sometimes older stands can make perfect sense in that scenario. And longleaf, you know, over time can beat out loblolly and natural stands. Of course, if we have decent silviculture in a loblolly pine, sorry, in a loblolly pine plantation, um, you know, you may be getting a mean annual increment of six, so that you can see that's even off the top of this graph. So loblolly pine is going to beat out any natural stand when it's planted in a plantation and managed well. But if you all do want a natural pine stand and you do want a longer rotation, Longleaf can be a good choice. It can win out. So again, looking at that Longleaf versus Lavalli comparisons, you can see why everyone, with, everyone went with Lavalli. Um, in a short rotation, it wins. It doesn't have the grass stage. And because it doesn't have the grass stage, it's much more uniform. So it's easier to manage, easier to log. Um, when you plant out Longleaf and it's in that grass stage and you come back a year later, you may have a hard time finding any of your seedlings. You may think you had a total regeneration failure, but if you put a fire through, you may be surprised how many are still there once they're released and they start growing in height once they get to that target root collar diameter size. Um, they, they grow slower at first, but that longer rotation can win. Um, the thing about longleaf compared to loblolly, however, it's a much thriftier tree. Um, Loblolly is kind of a nutrient hog. The more nutrients you give it, the happier it is, the faster it grows. Longleaf, you can actually damage it by fertilizing it in some cases at a loblolly pine fertilizer rate. So if you put out 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre, it may actually burn, give you a fertilizer burn on longleaf. Uh, so you want to be careful with that. There's rarely a reason to fertilize longleaf because if you're using longleaf, you're probably not trying to max out financial gain. So why would you be fertilizing anyway? But um, and that's why it outcompetes Loblolly on, on those really poor quality sites um, because it's thriftier with how it uses nutrients. It just flat out does not need nearly as many nutrients as Loblolly does in the soil. When you look at silvicultural systems to manage longleaf pine, um, you can use just about everything we've talked about. Um, so the, the two things you really have to keep focused on with any longleaf pine silvicultural system if you're using natural regeneration, we know the irregular seed production, that, that creates a challenge and drives a lot of what we do with longleaf pine regeneration methods. Um, and then the other thing, of course, to keep in mind is it is very intolerant of shade. It'll handle a little bit of shade in the grass stage, but once they start getting larger, they just do not handle shade at all. Think about all the little longleaf pines that they planted around the forestry building. And if you've watched them over the last few years, they seem to be fine until they get to about six, seven feet in height and then they die because they're just in too much shade at that point, they can't handle it. So, um, so you may get small longleaf pines growing in the shade. They're never gonna get too large uh, unless you can release them from that shade pretty quickly. So if you are gonna use a seed tree or shelter wood, getting the overwood off in time is critical. Um, they've tinkered with single tree selection in Alabama, the Forest Service. I don't think many people are doing that uh, to a great extent because it's really, to do single tree selection, you need a lot of light for longleaf. Um, single tree selection is generally gonna create a lot of shade because you're just opening single tree gaps. So where you can get this to work is with really low stocking levels. Um, if you're gonna go with an uneven age system and a shade intolerant tree, you need to really lower your expectation of stocking. So if you have stocking down at 60, 70, 80 square feet per acre of basal area, you have more of an open woodland uh, than a closed canopy forest. Well, in that case, single tree selection may work as management because you've got so much light in that area um, because the stocking's so low. The other thing to keep in mind with longleaf, it generally has a more open canopy than the other pines in the south, uh, and it is gonna let more light in. So that's the only reason single tree selection works. Group selection, you'd wanna get those groups as large as possible if you're gonna use those. So with clear cutting, um, often if we are using clear cutting to manage longleaf pine, it's because we'll be replanting longleaf pine. 
it's because you don't have long leaf pine on the site. You want to put it back on the site. You clear cut what's there, either pine, law volley, or mixed pine hardwood. Um, you spray herbicides and you get your long leaf established. Um, and so plantations are often necessary because long leaf isn't out there. It may also be necessary just because long leaf is difficult to get to seed in for natural regeneration. Heavy seed doesn't travel far, subject to high predation rates. You have to do cone counts like we've seen if you want to be sure you're going to get a good seed year out there. So that's challenging. With the shelterwood or seed tree, I've already showed you this graph. We went over this back when we talked about shelterwoods. Uh, and the idea here is if you leave even a little bit of overwood out there in a shelterwood, or if you even leave a few seed trees per acre out there in a seed tree, they are going to dramatically suppress your younger cohort you're trying to establish because of the extreme shade intolerance of longleaf pine. So really a timely removal of seed trees or overwood is going to be critical if you're naturally regenerating longleaf pine. Now when you look at uh, managing with uneven age silviculture, and some of this data applies even if you're doing a seed tree or a shelter wood, um, you know, that reading we did on these three regulation methods, area, volume control guiding diameter limit, and BDQ, that Jim Golden reading we did, that came from a textbook on longleaf pine management. Um, and so those have all been tried out in longleaf, they work, and we've all gone over uneven age silviculture already. You're always trying to cut the worst, leave the best. Now, when you look at these small longleaf pine trees, if they're four to six inches DBH, they will have stagnated in the shade uh, if you end up with the live crown ratio less than 20%. So if you look at seedlings, these seedlings are okay. Earl's holding this one, and you can see its live crown ratio looks to be probably 30%. That's a tree. It, it was released. You can see it actively growing in height again. It's going to be okay because we got the shade off of it in time. But if you've got them where they just end up with this tuft of needles at the top, less than a live crown ratio of 20%, don't even bother releasing them because they're, they're done. That seedling is uh, on the slow path to death. It's never gonna be a dominant or co-dominant tree. If you look at them and they're growing less than six inches in height a year, that's another sign. You waited too long, that tree's doomed. Uh, don't count on it as a source of advanced regeneration uh, for the next rotation. So there's a lot of utility pole management uh, for longleaf pine. Uh, we just went out last Friday and filmed a video on pole classification for field station this summer. Um, but if, if you guys remember those who have had field station, the Sandy Creek longleaf stand we went out to after you did the fuel loading exercise or right before I went over pole classification with you. And again, longleaf makes excellent utility poles. Um, it has less taper than our other Southern pines. It uh, has good stem form, lower incidence of forking, uh, lower incidence of sweep than our other southern pines. It has fewer branches than our other southern pines. And because it's very intolerant in shade, instead of just intolerant of shade, it's even a better self pruner. And so those are all traits that make for a better utility pole. There are companies out there in Louisiana, for example, where they're focused on managing longleaf pine on a longer rotation for utility poles. That being said, when you drive down the road and you look at all the utility poles that we've got around the south, uh, the overwhelming majority of them are going to be loblolly pines because we, you know, just don't have that much longleaf. It makes a better pole, but we've got a lot more loblolly than we do longleaf, so that's what we primarily make most of our poles out of. But it works really well for utility poles, and remember the real advantage of utility poles you're looking at values uh, in the range of two to three times as much per ton as saw timber sized trees of an equivalent size. Um, so it's even more valuable than saw timber. Okay, so if you need to go with a plantation, so let's look at some establishment treatments. Um, don't even bother trying to find bare root loblolly pine, nursery, or sorry, longleaf pine. Uh, nurseries won't sell you, for the most part, bare root longleaf pine. It's in the grass stage. The seedlings just uh, very low success rate. So you're almost always buying longleaf in containers. Um, you ideally want a root collar diameter of three-eighths of an inch. So you're hoping for a larger seedling if you can get that from the nursery. You need good competition control. And here's how you have to tweak your thinking a little bit. In loblolly pine, when we think about herbaceous weed control, you're thinking about doing it for the first growing season or maybe the first two growing seasons. Then you don't worry about it. 
and you don't worry about it because loblolly pine is a tree and it's taller than the competing vegetation, the grasses, the herbaceous strata after two years, and then it's not a problem. Longleaf is a different animal. So you may maintain a year or two of good competition control, but your longleaf may still be in a grass stage. And so at that point, if you just walk away like it's a loblolly pine plantation, you may come back and all that herbaceous strata, shrubs, subshrubs may have overtaken your site. Uh, goatweed's a real pest in particular for this, uh, and it may have shaded out all your grass stage longleaf seedlings. So with competition control, remember herbicides are an option, but with longleaf seedlings, as long as you do it the right time of year, and you've got those, the majority of your seedlings in that size class where the root collar diameter is half an inch or larger, put a fire through, okay? So fire is a good means of competition control in longleaf. So if you're gonna do a longleaf plantation, you may wanna think about that from the, the get-go. Uh, when you're out here on a stand like this, that's just been clear cut, go ahead and plan for fire lines, go ahead and get that infrastructure in place uh, so that you're set up to easily burn it later in the rotation. Um, just like with loblolly pine, plant it as early in the growing season as you can, and you have container trees. If we have adequate soil moisture in October, put them in the ground in late October around here. Uh, if, if it hasn't been raining, it's a really dry October. Wait till we get some good rains, we get good soil moisture levels, get them in the ground as early as you can. That gives you your best sh shot uh, at success. They're growing their roots um, over the, uh, you know, February sort of time period. They're actively growing roots. Th think about many of our days over winter around here. It's plenty warm enough uh, so the, the trees can be doing stuff that'll set them up for success in the following summer. Longleaf really does put on a good tap root, even more so than our other southern pines. And so that, that's gonna give it a, an advantage if you can get them in the ground early. Here's the wrinkle though. Uh, the guidelines for loblolly and shortleaf pine are plant them early, plant them deep. Remember we went over how you wanna get them in the ground deeper than they were at the nursery? Well, with longleaf and a plug, you wanna plant it a little bit shallow. And there's good reason for that. Uh, if you plant it deep, you may bury that terminal bud. If you bury that terminal bud and it gets rot, it gets too wet, it stays wet too long, um, you kill the tree. So you want to plant them a little shallow so you don't bury those terminal buds. And because you've got it in a containerized seedling, uh, that'll help you with planting them shallow. You're looking at a planting density of 200 to 500 trees per acre. Um, on the 200 end of that range, you may be trying to create an open woodland. You may have primarily aesthetic or wildlife objectives. On the 500 end of the range, maybe on that end, you're looking more at a timber stand where you probably want some of the other benefits of longleaf in terms of wildlife aesthetics, but you may also be trying to manage for utility poles or something along those lines. But keep in mind, you're planting these, you're looking at a long rotation with longleaf. Look at this stand here too. This kind of illustrates what you would expect in longleaf. This is a pretty uniform longleaf stand, but look at this. Some of these things are, you know, already almost 10 feet tall. Some of them haven't even broken out of the grass stage. Some of them have barely broken out of the grass stage. So longleaf is always going to be, you know, less uniform than loblolly um, on a given site with given soil culture. Now, this looks like pretty extreme differences right now. 50 years from now, uh, you're not going to see huge differences between the trees that broke out a little bit earlier than the others. They all will have reached max height for the site. The weaker ones that did really poorly would have either uh, died out by that point in stem exclusion or been removed in a thin or another operation. And by the end of the rotation, the, the stands can look very uniform for an even aged stand. So with more establishment treatments, with natural regeneration, this is a great example here in this photo. If you look uh, behind this person standing over here, there's a gap. Look how well those seedlings and saplings are doing in that gap. They're growing like crazy. Look at the heavy shade in this area under these mature trees. You have a few little seedlings in there, but again, if they're not released, these are dead. It's just a matter of time. They can handle shade when they're that small but you definitely don't see any of these taller seedlings in this shaded area. If they got that big, they would have died out. So with natural regeneration, think about that overwood, think about other sources of competition, uh, think about your seed crops, and then keep in mind, uh, you need bare mineral soil to get this tree to germinate. And so, you know, you may need to get fire into a stand decades ahead of your planned regeneration. If you've had fire excluded from a stand for a long time, it may have built up a thick litter layer 
and uh, one burn just isn't going to get rid of that litter layer. You may need multiple burns over a long period of time uh, to gradually get a, get rid of that litter layer and get you back to beer mineral soil. So, so think about, you know, if you think you're in a stand that you may regenerate 10 years from now and it's longleaf and you want to use natural regeneration, you've got a really thick litter layer, start getting a burn in there every few years as you can to start knocking that litter layer back uh, to help you succeed with your natural regeneration. <clears throat> In terms of the timing of your operations uh, with natural regeneration, um, we talked about the importance of getting the overwood off on time. We talked about how you're gonna need longer term competition control. You may wanna do some of the, your competition control treatments before you even remove the overwood uh, just to help you be more successful. Um, if you ended up with an extreme litter layer and burning you didn't think was a good option, you could go in there and use some sort of mechanical method. Uh, scarification would be what that's called but it may be a matter of essentially raking the stand or using a dozer to try and scrape off the litter layer, put it into piles. Maybe you burn it at that point, maybe you leave it alone. Uh, just leave those piles. You know, you're risking some erosion. So, you know, fire might be a better option for you, cause a little bit less of an erosion risk uh, than many mechanical methods would. Okay, so that was establishment treatments following regeneration treatments. So now let's think about the middle of a rotation and thinning. Um, so for Loblaw pine plantations, we've kind of been thinking of 75, 80 square feet per acre as the lower end of our management zone, and it may be even higher on some modern stands nowadays. Uh, you're thinking lower with longleaf, you know, so keep it above 60 square feet per acre. Um, but if you thin it back to 60, you're probably still fine. That's going to be what's going to maximize mean annual increment for you. Low thinning is going to be similar in longleaf even age stands, just like it is in pine plantations. And again, in that low thin, if you get a tree with less than a third to a half of live crown when it's larger, um, it's not gonna respond to thinning. You're, you're not gonna release it, it's too low vigor. When you look at this photo here, that's a perfect example of a longleaf stand that needs pre-commercial thinning. That stand is way too dense. Uh, Pre-commercially thinning it will knock years off your rotation length and it will make it much more resistant and resilient to disturbances like drought uh, that might otherwise kill a lot of trees there. Uh, when you look at that stand for pre-commercial thinning, all you gotta do is get rid of some of the trees. You don't have to take them anywhere. And so that's an example of a stand where you could send a crew out with machetes. Um, and you, you get a crew of uh, people with sharp, sharp machetes that know what they're doing. They can take down a tree that size in a swing or two um, and just go through and, you know, we know we want 200 to 500 trees per acre. Figure out what the spacing is on that and tell them, hey, leave me a tree, you know, every 10 feet. And if you do that, we know that's going to give you close to 436 trees per acre. Um, and of course, they can select the trees that look like they're a little more vigorous uh, there. If you're on a xeric site, you're probably not going to get stand conditions like this. If you're on that real deep sandy xeric site, um, you probably won't get stocking that high. They'll go through stem exclusion quicker because water's so limiting, and you may not need a pre-commercial thin. Okay, here's another treatment that we haven't thought about at all yet. Um, you don't really see this done in Loblolly much, if at all, uh, but it's litter raking. So this photo on the left, you can see just a small ag tractor um, and a baler, basically a modified hay baler, and they're baling up pine straw. And so people really like uh, longleaf pine straw. Uh, you can see it on the right there used in a, in a garden bed. Um, compared to Loblolly pine straw, it's longer, so people like it a little better just because it's longer, but they also like it better. It holds its color uh, for a longer period, probably looking at about two years. If you put Loblolly pine straw in your bed, uh, it will lose all its color. It'll go a dull gray in less than a year um, around here. So longleaf is a much better material for that purpose. Um, aesthetically, of course, if this is right by your house, um, and you're in an area where you've got connectivity to the woods, that's kind of the opposite of firewise, right? You're putting a flash fuel right up against your house. So uh, this would not be a good firewise practice. That being said, a lot of people do this. Okay, so when you wanna incorporate litter raking into your rotation, it can do a few things for you. We know we're on a longer rotation, um, but litter raking can make you a lot of money in the middle of the rotation uh, that helps you afford that longer rotation. 
Um, so you may be looking at removing, you know, 100 bales an acre that size. Uh, you may be selling them kind of the stumpage on the bales uh, for a few bucks each. And so a landowner might be making several hundred dollars an acre, ideally. Um, often it's less, but uh, in the middle of a rotation and your trees are still there. And so you haven't even harvested the timber. This is just an additional product. Let's think about what you need to do to implement this treatment silviculturally low. Uh, when you look at that stand, what you don't see are downed wood, downed branches, anything like that. So you need to clean the stand. The crews that are doing litter raking, if they get a contract out on your stand, they may want a contract that lasts for five years, 10 years, something like that, so they can come back repeatedly because there may be some effort at the beginning to get this set up so they can get it ready to rake. The other thing to look at here, look at the competing vegetation. Uh, this is a stand that mostly just has grass under it. Um, if you have a lot of woody shrubs, this is not going to be an effective operation trying to, to bale up all this straw. Here's something that is extremely uh, sensical from a common sense standpoint, but that I see students screw up all the time in silviculture. So, you know, I tell you you're writing a long leaf pine prescription. You immediately pull up your timeline, and if you have eight lines on there, you know, you're going to use at least six of them. Fire, 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 fire. You're going to put burns in there left and right. How easy is it to rake pine straw after you've burned the stand? Okay. If you want to do litter raking, you need to get fire out of your prescription because you can't rake litter that you just set on fire. Um, it will be gone, or even if some of it is still there, you'll be mixing in a lot of black material with it, and people aren't going to want to buy that to throw it in their, their garden bed. So, uh, so if you want to do litter raking, you need to get fire out of your prescription. Okay, in terms of when you litter rake, you want the stand to have reached crown closure. So here you see a graph of pine needle fall kilograms per hectare per year, and kilograms per hectare comes out pretty darn close to pounds per acre. Um, so if you look at this after age 15 or so, when you're gonna hit crown closure in a naturally regenerated stand, you're pulling off more than two tons per acre per year of pine straw. That's quite a bit of pine straw, if you get it all, you're not gonna get it all. Um, and then it settles in longer term, um, you get a peak here and it'll decline a little because your stand thins out uh, due to density dependent mortality following crown closure and you peak out at about a production of close to two tons per acre per year. You're not going to litter rake every year, you're going to litter rake every few years. Uh, so you can get a lot off. In terms of when the needles fall, here's a graph of the timing of the year and lo and behold needles fall in the fall. Um, so November, December are going to be your peak times for litter fall. So you want to wait till right after it's fallen and then get it as soon as you can. So your key litter raking times are January, February, March, April, probably. Keep in mind though, that's the wettest time of the year around here. So that's when stands are the least operable. So if you're going to do litter raking, you also probably want that Xeric Sandy site where it will be operable in the winter. Uh, it's not going to get too wet that you can't traffic on it. So that's a little guidance on when during the rotation and during the year you would ideally do litter raking. If you have a site that's wetter, you can litter rake in the summer. Um, that pine straw just will have spent, you know, six months out there on the ground already. It's going to hold up for less time uh, in garden beds. Okay, here's the issue with litter raking. If you're litter raking one to two and a half tons per acre per year off these sites, you're pulling nutrients off your site. There's nutrients in that litter layer. Uh, that litter layer may have five to 25 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year, okay? So it's the opposite of a fertilizer treatment. You're pulling nutrients out. So there's three possible things that could happen that are illustrated in this graph. Um, one, uh, and when I say one, I'm looking at line two here, you just get this gradual decline. You move some litter, your growth goes down. You remove more litter, your growth goes down. You remove more litter, your growth goes down. That would be kind of ideal because you could see that happening maybe, realize you're making a mistake and just stop. Uh, this line up here is the real dangerous scenario where you litter rake, you litter rake, you litter rake, and you're like, ah, we're good, we're fine. You know, we've been doing this for 20 years and the stand is just growing great. You know, there's no problem here. This is a resistant ecosystem where it's resistant to that disturbance but oops, you push it past some tipping point and it crashes pretty hard. Um, we saw this in uh, beach stands in Germany where they litter raked uh, those stands for animal bedding in the 17 and 1800s 
and dramatically reduced growth because they were removing all the nutrients. <coughs> Um, an example of a very sensitive ecosystem would be the dotted line down here, three, where you you do a little bit of disturbance like litter raking and boom, they, they crash pretty quick and fast and you're just, you know, you've screwed yourself over at that point. So when you look at the actual data on litter raking in longleaf pine, there are studies that show no effect on growth and there are studies that show a 5% DBH growth reduction, which is extremely minor. We, so we're kind of thinking that longleaf doesn't follow trend three. Um, it's more likely to be uh, trend one up there. So you still don't want to push it quite to that uh, breaking point. Fortunately, we know we're removing nutrients. We also know we have a treatment to put nutrients back in the stand. Um, and so here's what you want to put back in the stand. Um, you would do 100 pounds of uh, nitrogen. And I've got these on P205 and K2O basis. So you don't need to do those conversions. Uh, 60 pounds of P, uh, 60 pounds of K, 100 pounds of calcium, 25 pounds of magnesium. That'll replace about 10 years of nutrient loss. And again, you can see that nitrogen rate's about half what you would put out on a lava ice stand. Uh, nitrogen doesn't last forever in your ecosystems. Uh, nitrogen's going to give you a six to eight year growth response. Uh, so do this every six to seven years. And it will make up for what you're removing in litter raking. This makes up for the nutrients you're removing. However, this does not make up for uh, the organic matter that you're removing. Remember, organic matter does a lot in a forest soil. Um, it helps retain water, it uh, lowers soil strength, provides a, a good rooting medium. So this will replace the nutrients, but it's still not replacing everything uh, that you've lost through litter raking. So, so if you're gonna litter rake, don't burn the stand and throw some fertilizer in prescription as well so you don't uh, reduce growth of your stand in an unsustainable fashion. <coughs> and again, another common intermediate treatment in longleaf if you're not litter raking is prescribed fire. And we can see in the middle of a rotation, you're looking at trees uh, on the right here, very resistant to fire. So, and that's what I have on longleaf pine. Uh, any questions?